Hey random stranger, we are back for the final reaction to keep your hands off Azoken. I'm not quite sure how I'm feeling. I mean, I don't feel like I'm ready to say goodbye yet to this series. I have thoroughly enjoyed going along on these wild, trippy, imaginary excursions through Asakusa and Mizusaki's brains, and sometimes even Kanamori's as well. And so it's always such a weird feeling finishing off something that you've really liked, but uh, finish it off we will today. Recapping what happened in the last two episodes, so after the resounding success of the Robot Club promo, Azoken walked away with about 20,000 yen, but their labor hours all added up to about 1.8 mil, <laughs> which of course for Kanamori was completely unacceptable and they needed to fix this uh, egregious sin against sound business practice and so they're going to try and sell their stuff outside of school which uh, came with its own bureaucratic challenges and watching Kanamori lose her shit over the numbers is always a mood but it wasn't just that they are in the red but she also pointed out that having to work within the limitations of the school and its rules about what students can and can't do means that they can't function and work as they would in the real world which is super frustrating for her. I found it really cute how Mizusaki and Asakusa continue mostly to be oblivious to the realities of budgets and balance sheets. It's like they completely trust Kanamori to fight those battles for them, which she will, and I really appreciate how defined their roles have been throughout the series. To Kanamori, turning a profit is a matter of the club's survival and also her personal pride and she is not afraid to whip the other two into shape to get them to where they need to be. She's also not above using Mizusaki's model status to maximize their social media reach and she's thinking about network effects and uh, rustling up some merch to sell. Kanamori is a one woman business and marketing badass and the other two know that so they can concentrate more on the creative side of the work and this dynamic between the three of them uh, I've really enjoyed seeing grow and it takes place no matter what they're doing like in episode nine when they're walking through the Shibahama uh, district to do the shopping area it's Asakusa who's having fun pointing out all these uh, random objects and imagining new monsters and weapons with them, uh, including that endless spiraled shopping bazaar that goes down deep into the center of the earth, with Miss Saki just playing along and seeing how cool it all is. Meanwhile, Kanamori is just walking ahead, rolling her eyes and telling them to hurry up. But also, all the things that Asakusa had fun imagining around the district ended up in her storyboards for this next anime project that they're working on so it all kind of works out in the end uh also you know as i guess i knew immediately that kanamori wasn't just taking them out to lunch because she's nice you know she was up to something and she was like she ended up taking them to the noodle shop of that huge fan of mizusaki's which eventually leads to the deal that kanamori makes with the shibahama Chamber of Commerce to finance their film, um, which she does without Asakusa and Mizusaki knowing exactly how the details of that deal came to, to be. <laughs> and so that working relationship that they have, uh, where they leave certain things to a particular person and trust that they will come through in their area of expertise, has been so nice to see over the different projects that they've had to work on. One random thing about that noodle shop, so it was built on uh, an incline, which meant that they don't add soup to the ramen for fear of it spilling out. I don't know if that was just a quirk of the geography or if it was meant to feed into the broader theme of that whole district being run down and in need of a bit of a fixer-upper. Uh, plus an injection of a lot of new customers because it seems like the economy there is a bit dead outside of the tourist season. My favourite part of episode 9, of course, was the mini-muddy flashback, especially when they went into the 
illustrated uh, watercolor memory and it was Kanamori doing the sound effects for once. I also loved learning about Kanamori's family history and how she's descended from uh, some quality sake brewers who were the victims of sabotage and then how she witnessed this slow death of what eventually became a general store that her uncle ran. Um, but yeah, Mini Mori was like the cutest thing ever. <laughs> I loved seeing how innately hardworking she was. There was that little detail in that after her auntie gave her a bit of extra wages, she immediately goes and does some more cleaning. So even at that age, she had a superior work ethic and really felt like she needed to earn every cent that she gets. Uh, it was also very obvious that Kanamori had been born with her business brilliance and almost an addiction to earning money but it wasn't it's not that she earns money for the sake of earning it but as she said it's for the sake of measuring how smart you are and how good you are at deploying your resources towards maximizing productivity and you see that in the way that she opened up the store during a snowstorm and sold gloves individually instead of as a pack and also even the hot water uh, to the travellers for their cup ramen. Uh, most of all, it was just touching to find out that the trauma of seeing her uncle's shop close because of a lack of promotion is a huge reason why she is so passionate about making sure that that same thing doesn't happen to Aizoken. Other little things that I really enjoyed seeing in episode 9 was that montage of Aizoken continuing to work with other clubs to pull off this next project. So you had Asakusa with the art club again and Mizusaki teaching, I think it was the IT club, uh, certain movements and how they're meant to be animated. Plus we see uh, Dormeki joining in on one of their storyboarding imaginary trips for the first time and just sort of adding her sound waves to the mix. And Kanamori, as usual, is just pulling rank, you know, trying to keep the others grounded and paring back any extra bits that aren't absolutely necessary to keep their workloads reasonable and also accessible to all the normies who will be watching this short. And then, of course, we end with Ascus's revelation that everything they've been doing so far has been a performance uh, or as as Youngblood's translation said it's a scene so she starts by thinking about why she made that scene with the plane's interior pitch black and it was to highlight how vast and bright the sky is there was also that great collage of all of their previous projects put together and it all leads her to realize that everything she includes in a scene has a purpose it's to convey the greatest worlds that she can imagine. And she chooses what to draw and how to draw it. And I think, so previously she knew she was making those choices, but it was only in this moment that she connected those choices to how it helps other people experience and, and feel her worlds for themselves in exactly the way that she wants them to. So it was a pretty, profound introspection and I love that it spurs her on to make even more of an effort to consider how she presents her art to everyone which means that she won't allow herself to take shortcuts including no adding lasers that in practice shouldn't be visible to the naked eye and instead using all of these other visual cues to show energy emitted from the more plausible if still fantastical uh, direct energy weapons. Okay, episode 10. Uh, I thought it was so funny how Kanamori notices Mizusaki's tan line on her leg and is concerned, you know, because it might impact her ability to take on modeling jobs, which will impact the ability of Aizoken to promote themselves because she's a key part of their marketing strategy. Uh, the, the cool thing with Kanamori is though she's very good at not pushing Mizusaki too far. Like, she gets her to be the judge of the voice acting competition rather than the actual lead in the cast uh, of this film they're making, which she knew Mizusaki would hate even more. And it was actually a great negotiation tactic. You know, you put two choices on the table, one of which is obviously far worse so that the person will take the other 
if still slightly undesirable choice. Uh, so again, just kind of muddy big brain moves. One of the things that I loved most last time was this oddly playful clash between Kanamori and the secretary, uh, whose name Sakaki Sawande hasn't actually been spoken yet. Uh, but anyway, they clashed when Izokun got busted for taking a cut of Domeki's sales of her audio tracks online, and then later at that meeting with the student council and that panel of teachers. That meeting was interesting. Um, I really liked Rentress and Della Cruz's take on it, so... Hang on, let me pull their comment up. Right, so they write, I call the student council and teachers versus Azoken the Kanamori versus secretary chillness battle. Whoever is the more chill and laid back wins. Obviously, Kanamori won. <laughs> yeah, I also liked that they expressed their chillness by staring up at the ceiling. I mean, Kanamori doesn't even consider the arguments of the panel to be worth addressing. You know, she can't even look at them. They were all basically saying how making profits off of something erases the educational value of the activity, as well as all these useless platitudes about how they should be enjoying their time as students and not be rushing into adulthood. Um, and so I love how the secretary mirrors Kanamoni with that ceiling stare. You can tell, I think, that she enjoys the intellectual sparring that happens between them, uh, especially when she confronts them with the real reason why the teachers won't or don't want them making money. It's because they're scared it'll draw attention from parents and other outsiders who have a problem with it, and so they don't want to risk that. Um, so I feel like the secretary recognizes that Kanamori is the only person with whom she can match wits with. <laughs> she also cares, I think, which is weird, isn't it? Like, at the end of that episode, she... Uh, finds Azoken and then she asks Kanamori if she's managed to solve their profit issue and almost tries to give her suggestions like, you know, why don't you consider entering a competition or why don't you try working within the school's limits or bounds? And I'm not sure if she is trying to warn Kanamori with that line about how if they operate outside of the school, they're no longer protected. Um, I guess we'll see maybe in these last two episodes. But it was just nice seeing them have such a prolonged, honest conversation with each other, um, these two big brains. Uh, also, the secretary even gets some insight into the girls' process uh, when they're imagining how the... What was it? It was the propeller driven wish transmission machine uh yeah just imagining how that would work and she says another interesting line which is that she almost forgot that they're also in a world of their own uh so there's sort of like a a grudging respect from her that azo can have their own dynamics uh as a club and they're gonna keep doing what they're doing without needing anyone else's permission. Another character that I love that we're getting more and more of is Domeki. Uh, when Asakusa and Mizusaki get distracted by Domeki's sound effects, or uh, rather I think it's her snoring, <laughs> they run into her section of the building and they literally fall into her soundscape, which was so cool. Uh, it's also just nice seeing how the other girls follow Dormeki on her sound hunting trip uh, across the bay to the clock tower, uh, which Askaza has to sell as a scenario hunting trip uh, so that Kanamoni doesn't actually chew her head off. There were also a couple of references that went over my head, so thank you, Thomas, for pointing them out. Uh, there was that nod to Hayao Miyazaki when Asakusa is explaining to Kanamori the setting of Shibahama, and then that slick move that Kanamori does on her bike is actually from Akira, which I have added to my annual list to watch because it looks really badass. I think episode 10 did what Aizoken does best, which was to seamlessly integrate the storyboard scenes that Asakusa is describing with real life. So instead of seeing the girls walk up the stairs to the top of the clock tower, instead we get this elaborate scene with the girls as these villainous, well-dressed thieves sneaking up the tower to steal a precious artifact. 
those moments have been some of the most enjoyable in Azoken for me because you never know when they're going to jump out at you and there are a billion ways that Askasa could have taken the story because there is no limits to what that girl can imagine. Uh, I also I loved the crazy eyes that she gets when she makes that genius connection between the site where they're on which is where she's imagining where the direct energy weapons were developed and that ufo fight uh watching her connect all of her disjointed storyboards together uh is really something like have you ever just watched someone in their element riding out on the waves of their own brilliance and they are so caught up and passionate about something that they're elaborating on and explaining that they just lose sight of everything that's around them. Uh, I love it. I think it's a thing of beauty. So yeah, it was just so, it's nice to see Asuka go on one of her brands because it's just, it's the result of pure passion. Uh, the other fantastic moment was when they are all standing next to the loudspeaker, just holding their breath and waiting for the tolling of that bell. So all of that anticipation and effort just to get that one sound recording, uh, which is, that's just dedication right there. Okay, here we go, guys. Episode 11 of Keep Your Hands Off Azoken. Let's do this in three, two, one. <laughs> this dancing scene. <laughs> she not figured it out yet. Oh, it's just a bit over a month and a half. We're down to the wire. No, oh, that's each other's existence. Oh, hang on, did they change the OP? Or did I just never notice those flying things before? <laughs> oh, second last time with this brilliant OP. Out of the entire OP, I think my absolute favorite moment has to be those hands <laughs> Dead Sea Scrolls. I love that Kanamari is defending her club from all the other clubs. <laughs> oh no. Whoa. <laughs> Those BB guns. <laughs> what is happening?
Oh. No. <gasps> I thought she was on their side. No, I think she is, but she's acting as part of the student council, which automatically puts her against Azoken. She got it all on video. Oh. <laughs> Whoa, it just got real intense real quick. So they're stopping that club from working with Azoken? Just using any excuse to make things hard for them. Mizusaki and Asakusa were so excited when those security people jumped in. Uh. <laughs> Hmm. A flower that represents peace. It's so interesting they're showing like the ants dragging a dead body off to devour. Who's the ant queen? Yeah, so kind of many externally. Oh, this guy. She externally defends the club, but like internally, she's like yelling at them to hurry up and get their jobs done. This club advisor who now is just showing up. But that's sort of how she gets her inspiration, right? By playing around. Yeah. He gets it. Wakodo. He was also in that meeting with the panel teachers, right? Excuse me. Except he was just playing on his, uh, his little device. <laughs> Come on, Karamonis. Play a little. Her face says she hates this, but she will keep following them. Oh, that's crazy. That was very deep. Yo, they're like just philosophizing about life and heaven and hell, just casually.
Who is following them? Ah, fishies. This is so weird. So it's like a flooded subway. <laughs> oh, so much text. Ah, so cool. Whoa, what is that? Wait, was that just all of the scenes of their past together? Ah, <clears throat> oh, Kanamori, a hero. I thought actually Kanamori had pushed her, but... <laughs> so Stormaki is trailing after them? <gasps> They're shut down. Vice Principal. <gasps> ah, that's so like exactly what a mafia would do. <laughs> oh. Hey, more ask us a backstory. <clears throat> oh, the story of their friendship. What they're like the last two to be picked. <laughs> Man, the social anxiety is real. Uncle Of course that would be the line that kind of what he uses to make a friend like do you want to make some money? <laughs> <clears throat> oh that was the leaf and the money thing that Asuka was remembering before. Who would she sell these to? Oh. 
Well, it's the closest thing she's had to one. <laughs> so it's not friendship, it's just coexistence. I mean, whatever works, whatever definition works for them, individually. Oh, is this the same ramen store that kind of what he always takes them to? Oh. It's that same look. Hey, there we go. The difference between friendship and comradeship. Oh no, what a bad time. Still working hard, even though she's sick. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> oh my gosh. Hmm. It's too big for the school to stop now. Yeah, that's what they were fearing in the beginning, right? That people would have a problem with it, but really it's it's been a great advertisement for their school. Oh. <clears throat> That's family photos. <laughs> Hey, there's that wish machine from last episode. Whoa, this is so elaborate, this history.
like every single war ever. Oh, I love that switch into like monster silhouette into, you know, relatable people. It's sort of like the fear of the other. Oh, the, the cover scientists. Wait, so there's one on each side? Oh, <laughs> this is such an epic plot line. <clears throat> Ripples. And that's when they have the dance party. Oh. <laughs> oh, I love that it was born out of inspiration from her relationship with Kanamori. Uh, there we go. <laughs> Whoa, even when she's sick, she's terrifying. Just drawing little balls in the heads. Well, there we go. There's the voice actors. That's coming together nicely. Ah, oh, so cute. I love the waterfalls down the side. Oh my gosh, they're done. What's that beautiful piano track? Wait, what happened? Did they... Did they reach out to that group? It was like some kind of indie uh, track makers or something? Indie artists? Is this another form of sabotage from the student council? No, wait, I don't, now that I'm thinking back to it, I don't, I think 
uh, the secretary actually save them from the security guards. It didn't seem like the security gu- the security guards were working with the student council this time. It seemed like they had their own agenda. Maybe they were sent by the vice principal directly. Yeah, because when the secretary stormed in with that don't shoot sign, she was like, okay, we're taking over now. Uh, you guys can leave. So maybe it was her way of protecting the Azokan club, but she still has to not help them in a way. Okay, I think that's it. I still have faith in the secretary. But man, that was awesome the way that Asakusa started thinking about what enemies were when she saw all of these different ways that the vice principal and the teachers were trying to shut down this operation, this project, which led her to come up with that whole backstory with the two POWs on each side of the war. That was so cool. I love that. Oh, that is such a cool illustration. Okay. Damn it, why is this show so cool in every aspect? Okay, guys, here we are, last episode. Uh, will they, won't they get this project off the ground? I think we all know they will, but let's just see how they do it. If you guys are ready, let's do this in three, two, one, play. Maybe that'll work, though. Oh, but Mitsuki's really upset. Oh, so they kind of took it upon themselves to write this other track that they were inspired to. They just didn't realize it. <laughs> Wait, Askus is onto something. Oh. oh, stress. Wait, is she calling her like gangster friends? Don't make his face. Real world bites. Mm. 
Mm. There's the no more protection bit. Oh, she's like, you guys just figure out the film. Oh my god. <laughs> you know she can do it though, you know they can all do it. <clears throat> It's so real though, there is always, always something when you're on a tight production schedule, something that just comes in and torpedoes all your plans at the very last minute. It just never fails to happen. This working outside of the school's jurisdiction is really interesting. I guess this is what Kanamori has prepared for all her life, you know? That even without the school's, uh, I guess this being able to use, oh, we're students and so you need to be more lenient with us thing doesn't fly anymore. Kanamori still has their asses covered. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what she's going to do. But she definitely has some black market contacts, right? I mean, we knew that from previous episodes. <laughs> This having to refit everything to that sweet piano track, that sad piano track, is going to be really interesting. I kind of felt like it fit in a way, like it just lent it a different vibe, but none less, like, brilliant. Oh, good. <laughs> Is too happy. I don't think Mrs. Aki wants to ditch the dance scene though. <laughs> it's because it features all her movements that she loves. Oh. oh, I love those two different colors of waves. Whoa, <laughs> cancel culture, death of the pension system, talent, child rearing, contagion. Holy crap. <laughs> Just this mass dose of realism. That was crazy, that scene. Oh, so it's more like a bittersweet message. It's not a perfect ending. What is it? <laughs> also, I loved how before, um, when Mizusaki asked, 
well, if we do this, would you be happy with it? It's sort of like she's deferring to Mrs. Saki's vision, and I love that. You know, she really wanted that dance scene in there, but it's like, okay, I trust Asakusa and what she can see, and she's willing to stand behind her. That was really sweet. Oh, man. <laughs> Overnight montage. <gasps> oh, my God. <laughs> it's kind of on his contact. Oh, it's her herself. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Look at them. <laughs> Those bags, that's some serious bags. Oh my god. <laughs> These girls are something else. That's nuts. Oh man, here we go. <clears throat> Oh man, this is a huge event. I've never been to any of these sorts of conferences before. It must be an experience. <laughs> oh, she's so cute. It's amazing that she's standing on their feet, still awake. Kanamori feeding her kids. And this is like he poured her heart and soul into. Oh, at least she got it out there somewhere. What's up, Askusa? It's like she's sick with nervousness. <laughs> oh no. <gasps> Vice Prez just sneaking around. Hope she's not there to do any more sabotage. <laughs> She's like, what's the meaning of all this? Oh. Hmm, interesting. Is she like, it's because of her model, like her celebrity status. So when she says she craves like genuine criticism, she's like, I wish people would judge me for my own work and not because of who I am. <laughs> Just put some boxes in their heads. Oh, she's a genius. <laughs> they still know it's her, but... Sold out. <gasps> they did it. 
I don't want to see the film. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's like they sold it, but they never actually watched it themselves. So none of them have watched it yet. Well, what happened to Dormeki? She doesn't believe in group activities. This underground. Those chimes. Oh, it's so those buildings that just shoot up from the ground. It's so crazy. It's like reclaiming the land. I loved how they, they just showed the arrows and that's like sort of them communicating with each other.
I'm just trying to fix the bells. Hey, that's the pendulum with the riffles. It's a koi fish. I love when they do the side by side comparisons. The human and the copper. What is that? That weird plucking instrument. Oh. Oh, I string since. Oh, I like, so everyone watching this is like just outside being like, oh my gosh, this is actually happening. It's so real. Oh, she fell asleep. You see all the buildings. Yep. <laughs> As always. <laughs> Attack and roll. <laughs> Alright, we're heading to the clock tower for the last scene. Hey, what that car? <laughs> oh no. Hey, there's our mech. Baba. 
Yo, I mean, I've got to rewatch that entire short all over again. But man, I knew the way that they worked with that piano based track. It was definitely not something. Uh, it was very different to what they've done before with uh, the robot mech and the the first one, which is like that uh, alien fighter girl. I don't I don't even know how to explain what I'm feeling about it now. <laughs> For one, the track itself. It was basically very, very simple piano chords laid over with the synths and then whatever sound effects that they had with all the fighting that was going on. And then at the end, it built into this really intense, uh, still with the piano, but also with the violin synths and just this, these weird, quirky instruments. Uh, it just worked really well to convey a bit of sweetness and not just like a straight hardcore action scene, you know? Okay, let's talk more about these episodes and then the series as a whole. That was, it was not an ending that I was expecting, but I really enjoyed it. Okay, uh, I want to talk about that short more while it's still fresh in my mind and now that words are actually coming to me, because at the end of that episode, my brain was still adjusting to the direction their film had taken, which was so different to what we'd seen from them before, although of course still showcasing the brilliant movements and the setting and the angle shots and, and those fight scenes. Uh, so I'm trying to think why it felt so different. Aside from the obviously more somber tone of the music, it felt designed to reach people on a more emotional level rather than amaze and thrill with epicness and all the technical finesse of the fighting, even though all of that stuff was there as well. It was also emotional in terms of the message it was trying to convey, the whole the enemy is us and we are the enemy theme. Uh, my favourite moment in the short uh, and where it was most breathtaking um, is probably, unsurprisingly, right at the end where the human and the kappa uh, POWs each are uh, surrounded by their enemy and they step outside of their spaceship or the submarine with their arms up in that universal sign of peace. So not only had the music died down to just the synths and like that piano chord, but the whole story was kind of left up in the air. Uh, you don't know if the valiant efforts of those two POWs uh, to make peace and to reestablish uh, relations ever amounted to anything. You know, sometimes things don't resolve and that's just life. Uh, unlike the other two shorts where there was clearly a winner, this film um, didn't have that sort of end on a triumphant note. Uh, this was definitely a more open-ended ending, <laughs> which is also kind of where we're left in real life as well. Like the first short with the ninja girl ended up proving to the rest of the school that Azoken is a legitimate club and has huge talent that they should respect. You know, the second film, uh, the one with the crab tool and the robot mech fight was really well integrated with the resolution that we got between Mizaki and her parents and them recognizing their daughter's genius in choosing this path of animation for herself. But with this ending film, uh, one, because it's the last episode, we won't get that resolution unless there's a second season. Um, and even though we see the vice president of the school uh, picking up a copy of the DVD herself in disguise and then watching it, we don't know if this conflict between Azoken and the teachers in charge of the school, um, if that conflict will continue or if it'll escalate even, you know, and 
that's sort of all in keeping with Ascus's realization that not everything has this neat ending that you can tie a bow around. It also felt uh, super personal because of where Asakusa got her inspiration for the story from. This idea of coexistence, uh, which was set up in episode 9, where we see how she became friends with, or not friends, but comrades with Kanamori. Uh, it's not the way that the vast majority of people make friends, but it was so perfect for the two of them. One who had crippling social anxiety and who just wanted to grow up to be a hermit so that they could be left alone with their imaginary worlds. And then the other who operates completely outside of school or even broader social expectations and who is so confident in their very being and their ambitions that they don't really need anyone else. Um, I mean, of course, they would find themselves aligned together for the time being because society put them in a situation where it just made more sense to stick together. But then as the years went on, I guess with Kanamori and Asakusa, their interests just kept putting them in the same orbit to each other and so they just kind of stuck with it. To the point where, I mean, I'm not even sure that Kanamori and Asakusa would call each other friends now, but that's only because the typical normie definition of a friend doesn't fit their dynamic. Uh, it was really interesting when Asakusa was explaining why everything doesn't end in a huge dance party with both sides becoming really friendly with each other. Um, and you had that black screen with all of these depressing things that happen in the world just raining down on the girls. Uh, and the reason why in the real world, not everything ends so neatly is because even though you may share the same underlying ideals, there will always be things that challenge your ability to have the same aligned interests. And what's been fascinating about Azoken is that the drama these girls go through and all of the challenges, the way that they support each other, it has all revolved around producing these films that they are so passionate about making. In a way, it's it's very different to slice of life shows where friendship is the key theme and you see the characters grow in their relationships with each other through all sorts of key life milestones. With Kanamori and Asakusa and then later Mrs. Saki, they are something that's not quite friends or something that's beyond friends they are connected by the goals and the ambitions that are a direct result of their passion for animation or in Kanamori's case it's like making money off animation <laughs> um, which doesn't make their relationship any less strong than a conventional friendship but it was such a different lens through which to think about the bonds that people can form with each other and in a sense, I mean, that is what friendship is too. Like if you boil it down to its most basic ingredients, it's people who happen to have the same aligned interests. Uh, and given that definition, there's nothing stopping those interests from shifting in the future. You know, people change or sometimes the world changes them and as a result, relationships can change too. Yeah, I'll have to give this whole friend versus comrade thing a bit more thought. I feel like I'm still just skimming the surface of what's been said. Uh, and also I feel there were quite a few symbolic things happening in the short that I didn't cover, including the koi fish, which is traditionally a symbol of strength and perseverance because I believe they swim against the current. So uh, symbolic of how, you know, the two POWs kept thinking and doing what they thought was right, even though the two sides kept warring with each other. Um, the other interesting, there was an interesting throwaway line about Dormeki not feeling group activities and, and when she'd recorded the sounds that they needed, she kind of just went her own way. <laughs> um, I love Dormeki and so I was kind of thrown by that, but again, it does... It is completely in line with the whole, you know, interests can change and when they no longer align anymore, you know, people will just go their own way. 
the final thing I will take away with me from Azokin is I'm amazed at how much passion they managed to pack into these 12 episodes of the season. It didn't matter whether it was one of the three main girls or Ono from the Robot Club or Dormeki, whatever the character's choice of interest, uh, their voices and how their bodies are animated and and sometimes the wonderful uh, imaginary sets that were brought in around them were used so effectively to like punch us in the face and excite us with their passion for their respective subject matters. Even when, say, Asakusa would spit fire about the nitty-gritty uh, technical details about creature features and machine parts, most of which I didn't get myself, or Mizusaki would go on and on and on with her explanations of how the human body moved, these technicalities never got in the way of uh, conveying that underlying idea that these are people who live and breathe uh, these passions of theirs and they would die almost if they could no longer pursue those. So yeah, that is something that will stick in my mind for a long time and I guess it's meant to uh, inspire us who are watching it to hopefully discover what it is that lights a fire under our asses and to just go out there and to pursue that. All right, guys, that is a wrap for Keep Your Hands Off Azokin, uh, another one under the belt. Thank you to those who recommended this show to me and uh, to all of you who joined me in watching it. Uh, it's definitely been such a joy and I look forward to watching even more anime with uh, you all, should you choose to stick around. Uh, of course, you know, it's not the end of the discussion. Uh, please leave your thoughts down below or join us on Discord and uh, hopefully I'll see some of you, if not all of you, very soon.